Hello, this is Greg Scorzo, and you're listening to the Culture and the Offensive podcast, where we talk about various issues that are happening in and out and popping in and around the zeitgeist. And we also do town hall style meetings uh, in a beatnik vein, if you can imagine that, called Art of Thinking, where we discuss these very issues that we discuss both here in the podcast and on the Culture and the Offensive website in our articles, interviews, and dialogues. Uh, But we do it with you, the audience, uh, and we hopefully have an interesting conversation where we can probe your thoughts a bit, you can probe each other's thoughts a bit, and hopefully the conversation uh, between you and the people standing next to you will challenge you, provoke you, and get you to see the world in perhaps a different way, and also you might make some new friends. So today we're going to be talking about something on this podcast, which has kind of been a hot topic for about four or five years, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech recently has become a topic that people are talking about on, you know, all the different social media platforms because of what's happened with Alex Jones as of late. And no, I don't mean the Alex Jones from the one show. I mean Alex Jones, who runs Infowars and is a notorious conspiracy theorist. He is often referred to as a alt-right or right-fringe lunatic, and his style of debating and explaining political events often involves a lot of screaming and invectives. So what's happened in uh, the past, I think, week or so is that the major social media platforms voluntarily removing his content. I think it started with um, Apple removing five or six of his InfoWars podcasts from iTunes and his podcast app. Then later YouTube terminated the Alex Jones channel, Facebook unpublished four InfoWars pages, and the streaming music site Spotify announced that the Alex Jones show was banned from the platform. What's interesting is I think Spotify, um, when they justified this decision, they made the point that they didn't ban him because he was offensive or politically incorrect. They banned him because They felt that his material constituted some kind of a threat or incitation of violence against people who are uh, on his hit list of of his version of deplorables, as it were. So that's why Spotify did it. But what these kind of major social media platforms and music streaming services have in common here, which seems to be putting them in line with other things that are happening with Facebook uh, about fake news and so on, is there is what seems like a attempt by major social media platforms, which are aligned with kind of the globalist network of institutions that many believe have an unfair anti-democratic uh, stranglehold on Western civilization and, and political change that could happen in individual Western countries. These institutions and the social media platforms affiliated with them are cracking down on what they perceive to be, I think, a threat to social stability and cohesion. Now, if I were to put my head in their perspective, what I think they think is going on is they think that we've achieved an incredible amount of progress for the way that the West treats minorities and disadvantaged groups. Um, They think there's still a lot of work to be done, but there has been a backlash movement, a nationalistic movement of nasty people who are bigots, who have a figurehead in the President of the United States, Donald Trump, and who are responsible for the decision of the UK to vote Brexit, that these nasty people are undermining all of that progress, whipping up racial hatred, lying through their teeth, uh, making people distrustful of rigorous, honest, integrity-laden establishment journalism, and pushing Western society in a direction where it's like a repeat of the 1930s. And pretty soon you're going to start to see concentration camps where different minorities are going to be put in cages. And this is somehow all going to eventually spiral out of control and turn into either another World War II situation or a civil war or something which is like going to turn the clock back to the sort of instability and the conditions which created global catastrophes in the early part of the 20th century. I think that's what these uh, institutions and social media platforms are worried about. And I think they see Alex Jones as one of the primary figureheads in an alternative media, which is all about not just denigrating factual accuracy and promoting bigotry, but also kind of manipulating stupid people into um, developing very hateful attitudes that will eventually 
if they're not checked in some way, make society spiral into a very illiberal, uh, far-right kind of chaos, which nobody wants. Um, so I think that is the perspective of the people who are doing this kind of, um, not censorship, but doing this kind of information filtering, using the power of the fact that they are private companies and Alex Jones is a user of a private company. So this isn't official state censorship where the state is coming in and saying that Alex Jones can't be on iTunes or Alex Jones can't be on Facebook. It's those companies themselves wanting to take a stand on behalf of their community standard policies to really undermine what they see as a very dangerous threat to the progress of society, the multicultural, the anti-racist, and the anti-sexist values of society, which they see as community norms that really bind together everybody in the community who isn't some kind of a horrible dickhead. So I think that's kind of the rationale behind not just these social media platforms uh, taking down Alex Jones, but also these platforms trying to regulate information more thoroughly so that it's much harder, at least, for publications of alternative news media to put posts up that these companies would describe as fake news or factually inaccurate or propaganda of some sort, which is pushing people towards what is now called the alt-right, meaning the factions of alternative media on the right, which are interested in white nationalism and things like that. Um, so I think this is all part of a big concerted effort by social media platforms that have strong globalist ties to in some way take a stand on behalf of everyone, take a stand on behalf of its own community standards against alt-right lying, manipulation, whipping up of hysteria, whipping up of bigotry and so on to kind of save the West from going down this rabbit hole that seems uh, to be in a way most symbolically represented by President Donald Trump in the U.S. and in the U.K., Brexit. So I think that's the perspective, that's kind of the ideological filter from which these decisions are being made. And I think this is a bad filter. This is a deeply mistaken and confused way of looking at a situation which is far more complex than this narrative suggests. For instance, one of the things that this narrative really overlooks is the way in which the political spectrum has changed in the last five to 10 years. So if you go back to say 2007, 2008, uh, around the time of the first Obama uh, election, left and right had a very different meaning to what they have now. So at that time, left was associated with more welfare state protections, economic redistribution of wealth, a more peaceful dovish foreign policy, uh, gay rights, abortion rights, things like that. Uh, more civil liberties, and insofar as the Democratic Party took stances about these issues, say in the U.S., that went against these positions, they were seen as kind of kowtowing or compromising themselves for the right to win elections, because the right were supposed to represent scaling down the state, having a more warlike attitude towards foreign policy, and restricting rights related to different civil liberties. And even as far back as 2007, the left was the side of the political spectrum associated with freedom of speech and kind of not glorifying, but allowing and to some extent promoting the idea of culture, which is offensive, which makes people feel uncomfortable, whether it was, you know, Marilyn Manson or whether it was gangster rap or whether it was earlier things from the 60s and 70s, which were violent or surreal or heavily sexual, the left was always the side of the political spectrum, which, you know, was pro-sex worker rights and, you know, against kind of shutting down strip clubs and things of that nature, against shutting down adult bookstores. So this was a very different left and right to the left and right that we have now. What's changed, and specifically I think what's changed in the last five years, is because of social media, by about 2013 and 14, the driving forces of activism on the left were pushing the left away from what it had been in the previous decades and more towards what it is now, which is progressivism. Now, progressivism is very different to the left that I grew up with and the left that I would even say I was a part of. And it seems like one of the big problems with mainstream globalist institutions and social media platforms 
who talk about Trump as this big threat to progressive left-wing values is they don't understand that the progressivism of 2018 is totally different to what left meant in 2008. And the progressivism of 2018 isn't even, strictly speaking, just left, it's mainstream. This is the big change that's happened in the left that nobody seems to be noticing right now. So what is progressivism and how is it different to the old left? Well, if you're a progressive, you may be a socialist, although you don't have to be. There's plenty of progressives who don't like socialism and who even don't like uh, socialist -y candidates like Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, although I say socialist -y rather than socialist because there's a bit of some contestation about how socialist they actually are. But you can be a progressive and even be a kind of libertarian who wants minimal state interference in the economy. Some of the things from Reason.com, the magazine which is libertarian in the U.S., kind of suggest a kind of progressive libertarianism. Um, also, progressivism isn't particularly dovish in foreign policy. At the moment, it tends to be quite hawk-like in its foreign policy. It wants to support and expand uh, NATO, NATO's influence over the geopolitical sphere. It tends to be quite angry with Russia because it sees Vladimir Putin as being some kind of a world domination figure, a kind of new Hitler who was responsible for everything from Brexit to the election of President Trump. And amongst a lot of progressives, um, there is, I'm not sure there's a tendency to want to go to war with Russia because nobody wants war with Russia. But progressives are certainly willing to risk more in standing up to Russia. They're willing to risk the possibility of war to a much greater extent than non-progressives are when it comes to taking a principled stand against Russia, which it sees as having this sort of really nefarious, covert, spy activity-based influence on world events. Some people who aren't progressives see the progressive perspective on Putin as being something like the way the people of Oceania in Orwell's 1984 saw Emmanuel Goldstein, that Trump uh, is, is sort of the, the symbolic rebuke to everything positive about Western civilization in the last 50 years, but really the man behind the curtain, the man who put him in power, is Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin is kind of like this mysterious, dark, evil, all-powerful figure who can make you know the world go in the direction that he wants to through all of the various covert mechanisms at his disposal for sneakily turning the West against its best values. That seems to be the progressive kind of narrative about Putin in Russia, that this is sort of like an existential crisis in the West that we're facing, not because of uh, borders so much that are being violated by Russian armies and so on, but it's more about Russia having an influence on the world's space and on the geopolitical system, which is extending beyond Russia itself and going into the elections of Western countries and the populist movements of Western countries. So those are two respects in which conservatives and progressives can find themselves in an alliance with each other. And this is why both progressives and conservatives are often referred to as the establishment. Even though progressive leftists and conservatives are very different, they tend to align on these issues in a way where other parts of the political spectrum, especially the parts of the political spectrum that progressivism wants to marginalize, those parts of the political spectrum go in a different direction. The other key elements of progressivism, which are different to the older left, is progressivism is very much about pro-identity politics activism. So it's about making a very clear, unambiguous claim that the West is still racist, it's still sexist, it's still, uh, you know, all of the things that civil rights campaigners try to fight against in the 1960s. It still has a problem with people of color. It still has a problem with minorities, whether they're minorities within the population or gender-based minorities or women and what have you, or alternative to Christian uh, religious groups. It still has a problem with different cultures. It's got an even perhaps bigger problem with these things than it had before. The idea that things have gotten better is a massive illusion, and we have to right at once um, fight for the rights and the dignity and the respect and the safety for marginalized peoples. So that's a big part of progressivism. Like maybe the biggest part of progressivism is identity politics. And it's so threatened at the moment because the backlash against progressivism, uh, which it wants to suppress, is 
I think primarily motivated by a backlash against identity politics. The other elements of progressivism that tend to be uh, argued against in alternative media are media effects theory, which is the idea that uh, we should look at people um, as essentially mimics who do whatever they see represented in media. So in order to have a population which does nice things for itself and other people, we have to create a series of media, advertisements, fiction, movies, etc., etc., which all have positive messages, because without positive messages, people do bad things, because whenever people look at a free and diverse media, they can't handle it if they see messages that aren't good. So this is a big important part of progressivism. This probably is what's motivating a lot of the attempts by progressive private companies to get rid of things like Alex Jones. And this is an important aspect in which progressivism is not like the old left of the 60s and 70s, which was very much about encouraging free culture where you could be offensive and could expose the population to a bad message, but the population could handle it and thus you could get this free media that for progressives I don't think is a good idea. Also, another part of progressivism, which is really important, is they really want to, unlike the previous left, which was all about civil liberties and freedom, they really want to protect and regulate society to make it safer, including taxing things to give certain groups incentives not to self-harm. They want to make you know it much less possible for children to run around and break their knees. So there's all sorts of regulations about what children can do, which is part of progressivism. Um, you know, there's all sorts of regulations about accommodating the mental health needs of people so that for progressivism's opponents, it often feels like the regulations that are being demanded on behalf of the psychically vulnerable are making everybody else have to walk on eggshells, especially if there's certain things that you can't say in front of people who have certain mental health conditions. So that's a big part of progressivism, again, where they might actually be very compatible with conservatives to a larger extent than they were the earlier versions of the left, which progressivism is most definitely not. And probably the most difficult to get around, difficult to handle, difficult to deal with aspect of progressivism for non-progressives is that it politicizes antisocial behavior. So if a progressive finds out that there is some crime that gets committed in society, you know, whether it's rape, whether it's harassment, whatever it is, if it's a nasty crime that seems to be happening to one of the groups that in identity politics is seen as a victim, then suddenly the group that is doing this crime at minimal levels gets blamed and is seen as complicit and responsible for this crime. So a good example of this, the kind of classic example of this is the issue of rape, right? So men, according to progressivism, are seen as part of the dominant group, Women are seen as part of the subordinate group. The idea in progressivism is that that hasn't really changed, even though it looks as though it's changed. So the fact that a minority of men rape women means that all males are complicit and responsible for getting these rape numbers down and possibly eliminating them. Now, the problem with this, if you're not a progressive, is it looks like bigotry. Because bigotry is all about tarring everybody within a certain demographic group with something only a minority of its members do. And progressivism has a real problem not noticing or trying to actively deny the extent to which it has ideas that if you switch the demographics around would look obviously horrendous. So imagine if you could show in some statistic that say that black men were more likely to rape than white men. To suddenly say that all black men were somehow responsible for or complicit in the small amount of rapes within the demographic would be seen as extraordinarily racist to progressives. But they can't see that they're repeating that same bigotry when they do the same kind of argument, but which somehow gets excused because the group which is guilty of the antisocial behavior in the minority of numbers is the oppressor group, and the group which is the victim of this behavior is the victim group according to the oppression axis of progressivism. So it, it winds up being this weird kind of revenge politics where I get to oppress you if I'm in the victim group, and you have to take it if you're in the oppressor group. That's the problem with progressivism. It prevents any kind of universal sense of what bigotry is. Bigotry is only bigotry towards the victim, but it's not bigotry if it's bigotry towards the oppressor.
That's the fundamental idea in progressivism that is not only against the right-wing backlash against progressivism, but it's also against the left of the previous decades. It's only been very recently that the left has embraced this idea of bigotry, where bigotry is only bigotry if it's against the people who are at the bottom of oppression hierarchies. But if it's against the people at the top of oppression hierarchies, according to progressive ideology, it's not bigotry. Or if it is something like racism or sexism, it's a very mild, uh, not very interesting kind of racism and sexism. It's certainly not worthy of condemning to the extent that bigotry from oppressor groups to oppressed groups is worthy of condemning. So that's an important part of progressivism, which is totally at odds with the previous decades of the left. And this is also why a lot of people who think of themselves as left-wing on issues like abortion rights or the economy are suddenly leaving the left, or at least feeling very alienated from it, because they don't like progressivism, because this is not the left they grew up with. You know, this isn't Martin Luther King. This is anti-Martin Luther King. This is closer to Malcolm X. But what's extraordinarily important about contemporary progressivism is it's not just the left that tends to have taken it on board. It's really the entire mainstream. It, it's globalism and globalist institutions and social media platforms associated with globalism. They've all taken on progressivism, I think because they are insecure over the fact that there are populist movements in Western countries at the moment, which are a challenge to progressivism and a challenge to the idea that the reason why we have all of this prosperity and all of this enlightened respect for minorities in the West is because we have globalist institutions which can sort of bypass or control or supersede or ignore or even re-educate to some extent populations which could really provide a strong challenge to it. And this is why I think that social media platforms that are associated with the global economy like Apple and Facebook and Spotify are doing their best to make it hard for symbols of alternative media like Alex Jones to use their platforms to spread messages that these kind of globalist social media platforms find really dangerous and destructive. Now another problem with this globalist way of looking at alternative media is it kind of caricatures alternative media and it caricatures the anti-progressive movements on the internet. Most anti-progressive media isn't like Alex Jones. Alex Jones is kind of a fringe extremist sector of the alternative media sphere. You know, he's kind of not even the alt-right, he's more of the conspiracy alt-right sector of the anti-progressive alternative media sphere. But most of what's in that sphere is pretty broad. It's, it's a broad church of different people and ideas and vloggers that are all united in their assault on core progressive principles. But just because they're assaulting core progressive principles, that doesn't mean that most of them are what we would characterize in any sensible sense as extreme right. A lot of people, you know, are vloggers like Shoe on Head, uh, The Amazing Atheist, comedians like Jonathan Pye and so on, you know, who are, you could argue, in many ways, classic Democrats and labor supporters, you know, people on the left, who for whatever reason, or for various reasons, are taking serious umbrage with progressivism and the way that it's impacting Western culture. So it's not just kind of fringe white nationalist conspiracy theorists who constitute what is called the dark web, the sort of intellectual uh, rebuke online to progressive ideology. You know, that has people in it like Jordan Peterson, who you could argue is kind of a center-right figure. It's got libertarians like Larry Elder. It's got anarcho-capitalists like that guy T. And there's even some things that come from traditional left-wing figures like Noam Chomsky or Slavoj Zizek, which wind up being circulated on the dark web because those guys were from a very different left, which was very anti-globalist. And the kind of anti-globalist elements of the far left in previous decades are now, in their own way, aligning with various aspects of the anti-progressive movements online. So the idea that the anti-progressive alternative media is just a bunch of, you know, extreme white ethno-nationalist conspiracy theory lunatics is totally not representative of what the dark web and the anti-progressive movements online are really about. So to target Alex Jones as though he's some figurehead of this 
populist movement, which is against progressivism, is ridiculous because he's not representative, really, of the movement against progressivism. Most of that movement is anti-globalist and libertarian, but most of it isn't white nationalist, and most of it isn't trying to rehabilitate any kind of old-fashioned Nazi-like racism or sexism or anything like that. There aren't figures like that in the dark web and in the anti-progressive movements, which are extremely dangerous in their own ideas, but within the dark web and within the anti-progressive media, I would say that those people are pretty fringe. That what's mainstream is, is either libertarians who don't like progressivism for various reasons, or it's people on the left who don't like progressivism because those people are more like the left of a previous decade. Now, one other reason why platforms like Facebook and Apple and Spotify want to make it harder for alternative media, which is anti-progressive, to expand its audience reach is because they often say that what distinguishes mainstream establishment media, you know, the CNNs and the MSNBCs and even the BBCs, from the intellectual dark web or Infowars or anything else that they find objectionable, is that the mainstream media are supposedly the fact checkers, the ones that are concerned with factual accuracy, the ones who do journalism with integrity and impartiality, which don't whip up hysteria and hatred against disadvantaged groups. Now, the problem I have with this way of looking at establishment media, even if I think on balance established media is factually more accurate than, say, somebody like Donald Trump, is that establishment media, in constantly aggrandizing itself for its reputation for empirical accuracy and fact-checking, gets away with things which I think are not lies per se, but they're more effective and sinister than lies. Now, this is what uh, in the past used to be called spin. You might call it spin now. Maybe there's another word for it. I don't know. But mainstream media can be much more dangerous and misleading because it's factually accurate. Now, I know that sounds really bizarre, but let me explain to you what I mean here. You can make statements which involve no factual inaccuracies, but which are completely wrong in the things that they suggest, but they're more harder to point out as propaganda or propagandistic because they don't contain any false factual statements. So what would be an example of that? Okay, here's one. Greg Scorzo did not vote for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 presidential election. Scorzo lost some fans for doing this because in this way he showed himself as being on the same side as alt-right provocateurs such as Milo Yiannopoulos and Richard Spencer, both of whom passionately campaigned for Trump and against Clinton. Now, do you see what just went on there? Do you see what just happened, right? I made a statement which contained no factual inaccuracies. Everything in that statement is empirically true, but it's completely bonkers because I do not like and have nothing to do with either the alt-right or Richard Spencer and Milo Yiannopoulos, insofar as he is called Old right, that's a misleading bad label because he's not an ethno nationalist, he's a civic nationalist. So, whether you don't like his politics, whether you would consider him part of the right which supports Trump and you see him as part of you know something generally negative, you can't in a careless way say, Oh, he's the same thing as Richard Spencer because he's not. He's not the same thing as Richard Spencer, he's not the same thing as Lana Laktoff, he's not the same thing as Jared Taylor, and I have nothing to do with that spectrum at all, because the reason I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016 was because I was disgusted at her treatment of Bernie Sanders, who was my candidate. Trump was not my candidate. But by associating me with the alt-right in a way where you don't use any factually inaccurate lies, you're doing something which is very, very effective. You're getting people to mischaracterize me, and you're using an extremely powerful form of psychological manipulation. And one of the reasons it's so powerful is because you're saying, look, I'm the one who fact checks. I take care of my statements to make sure that they're true. Those other guys, they don't. Don't pay attention to them. Pay attention to me. I would never mislead you because nothing I ever say is factually inaccurate. And maybe it's true that on balance, mainstream media tends not to tell very many, you know, empirical falsehoods. But just because it doesn't tell that many empirical falsehoods, that doesn't mean 
that it's less misleading than the media that it wants to caricature as a group of liars and corrupt demagogues. It's important to remember that even factual accuracy can be a propaganda weapon if it's used by an establishment attempting to psychologically manipulate people into perceiving any alternative media perspectives as lies and snake oil. And also, the idea that the mainstream media, as opposed to the alternative media, is the tolerant and accepting media, the compassionate media, that's also completely bonkers because mainstream media is largely progressive. And progressivism is extremely intolerant. It's extremely intolerant of diversity of thought. It tries to create uniformity of thought and uniformity of politics and uniformity of speech whenever it can. And on top of that, progressive media is constantly caricaturizing its opponents to get people to simply dismiss them and write them off as lunatics. The person who it does this with the most is one of the few intellectual celebrities to have emerged from the anti-progressive corners of the internet, and that's Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson is not really all that right-wing. He's kind of a center-right conservative who in some ways concedes a lot of things to kind of centrist Democrats. He's not really a hardcore Republican. He's not really a hardcore libertarian. You know, he's not anything like a white nationalist who has any affinity for identity politics of either side of the political spectrum. But because he is a articulate voice who presents arguments against progressive sacred cows, there's always this attempt to mischaracterize things he says to make him look like a complete lunatic. I mean, the latest example of this is when people were saying that he believed in enforced monogamy, where women should be forced to get married to men who they don't fancy, which is completely bonkers and a complete misrepresentation of what he actually did say when he was describing a concept that he used the terms enforced monogamy to refer to. So the media is constantly caricaturizing its enemies and trying to create uniformity while presenting itself to consumers as the trustworthy, the tolerant, and the fair and biased fact-checking media that you should trust in the same way that you would trust scientific information about what kind of aspirin you should take. The mainstream media is really going out of its way at the moment to try and present itself as knowledge and present its competitors, its, its adversaries, as liars, cheaters, racists, populist demagogues, uh, you know, just the scum of the earth, deplorables, whatever name you can think of. Uh, so that people won't listen to the alternative perspectives and will only take the establishment progressive narratives as anything resembling uh, what in the public's interest everyone should believe. And there's an even bigger irony, which is the kinds of equality that get promoted in progressivism are totally antithetical to the kinds of equality that motivated Western society to become anti-racist and anti-sexist. So equality of outcome, for instance, which is the big equality promoted by progressives, right? that actually undercuts equality of treatment. And equality of treatment is the kind of equality that motivated society to join Martin Luther King in opposing racist discrimination against African Americans in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s. Equality of outcome is about different racial groups and different gender groups and, and marginal groups having the same representation and access to things as the dominant groups, right? Now, that's a silly idea, because whenever you have any combination of demographic groups working alongside each other, competing in a capitalist economy, necessarily, the outcomes for all those groups will never be equal. So to assume that the inequality in those outcomes is somehow evidence of discrimination is absolutely bonkers. Because discrimination is the very thing that you would have to do in order to create a quality of outcome. That is, a quality of outcome would involve re-socializing people or putting people in certain positions of uh, power or giving them certain jobs in a way where you would be treating them as representatives of the demographics that they come from rather than individuals. So in order to have equality of outcome, you can't treat people as individuals. You have to discriminate against them on the basis of their gender or their race or some other demographic, which supposedly puts them at the bottom of the power hierarchies in society. 
So you have to give people jobs on the basis of their skin color. You have to give people certain preferential treatment on the basis of their gender and so on in order to level out all the power inequality, supposedly. But ironically, it's those very inequalities which are the product of treating people as individuals. And that kind of equality, giving people equal treatment as individuals before the law, that was the equality which motivated Western society to take on anti-racism and take on anti-sexism as major core public values. This kind of equality that progressives are promoting would dismantle all of that and require everyone to see themselves not as an individual, but as a representative of different groups in power struggles. Now, not only is that ridiculous for the reasons I just mentioned, but the idea that somehow a good, safe, cohesive, kind, compassionate equality is going to be one in which you have to battle other groups for power is absolutely ridiculous. Because first of all, power corrupts, and second of all, no two individuals have the same amount of power. So it's crazy to think any two demographic groups would ever have the same amount of power. It's just bonkers. But because progressives are good at using terms like equality to describe what is really a discrimination game about allowing people to struggle for power in a social space where nobody has equal amounts of power to start with, independently of any racism or sexism, that just creates an atmosphere of tribal warfare. And so we're suddenly in an era where the establishment media and the establishment press are trying to goad people into tribal warfare in the name of equality, while simultaneously telling everybody that the real threats to equality and the real threats to kindness and compassion and care for the marginalized are from the backlash against this push for tribal warfare, which is coming from the left and the mainstream. I mean, you couldn't make this up. It sounds like science fiction. It sounds like a science fiction story I would have written probably in uh, 2009. I mean, that's how crazy it is. That's how absolutely bonkers it is, because it really does feel like we're living in an era where our opponents aren't people who disagree with us. We're living in an era where our opponents are trying to play some kind of mind game, uh, where there's a lot of, you know, derailing and gaslighting and cruelty expressed in that mind game. I mean, one of the interesting things about feminism is that all the tool, all the kind of tools that they use to get people to evade the fact that their arguments don't work is they accuse people of doing things which actually progressive media does very effectively, which is, you know, discrediting, derailing, gaslighting, and these sorts of things. People who do these things are very skilled at them, interestingly, because they're very quick to accuse their opponents of doing them before the opponents can actually say, no, you're the one who's doing these things. And that's a very effective way to keep on doing them. So this is like a giant mind game. Now, getting back to free speech, the reason why free speech is important is because we need free speech, we need to honor free speech, we need to protect free speech, and promote a good conception of free speech in an era where everyone is using speech to largely play mind games or marginalize people or stigmatize people or make people scared to say what they think. And that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do because while on the one hand, I can certainly deplore the censorious impulse in the globalist social media companies that want to get Alex Jones off of the roster of uh, people who they want to allow to use the platforms, I can also acknowledge that this is a complicated issue because this is not the state coming in and telling Facebook or Apple you can't play Alex Jones. This is companies themselves not wanting to allow someone to use their platform because they believe that this person's views and what they express in their content violates the community standards of this platform. And it's quite difficult to argue that a private company should have to take people into their, you know, user data banks who promote messages that are at odds with what the private company sees as the community standards that they've decided for their users to have to abide by. Um, that's a difficult one, because in a way it's very similar to the issue of the bakery that doesn't want to bake cakes for gay weddings. So if you force that bakery to make 
a cake for a gay wedding. You're essentially forcing a private organization to celebrate a value system or a political idea that they are very much at odds with. And that does seem kind of like a form of coercion. And in a similar way, it seems like it would be a form of coercion for a private social media app or whatever to have to play Alex Jones uh, clips or Alex Jones podcasts when that content seems to go very much against their community standards. So I'm kind of torn on this issue about whether a company like Apple or Spotify or iTunes should have the legal right to only play progressive media or progressive friendly media because I can see the force of the objection that private organizations should not have to take on particular political stances that they are very much opposed to. That seems kind of coercive. But here's where it gets even more complicated. When you're dealing with social media platforms like iTunes or Facebook, they're so widely used by the public. They are essentially public forums. They're almost like virtual town halls. It just seems to me that when a social media platform is used as widely as something like Facebook or, you know, iTunes podcasts or whatever, when those kind of social media platforms are almost like public forums for everyone, my intuition is that they have to lose a little bit of the private company rights that they would have if they were much smaller enterprises that catered to specific groups of people which were not endemic of the public at large. But if you have a social media platform which begins as a private company but becomes something like a public forum that almost everyone, regardless of their ideological stripe, uses to communicate various ideas and discuss things, then it seems like your media company should be necessarily pluralistic in a way that if it were smaller, if it were just tailoring to a small group of fans, it might not have to be. Now, what do I mean by pluralistic? Well, this gets really into the various versions of free speech on offer in today's political climate. Progressives tend to want anti-pluralistic free speech, and the anti-progressives tend to want pluralistic free speech. Now, what's the difference? Well, we can all agree that free speech requires the state not coming in and telling you what you can and can't say. You need to be able to say things that are wrong, false, uh, things that upset people, and so on and so forth, right? But anti-pluralistic freedom of speech says, yes, that's true, but social progress that enables society to protect minorities and disadvantaged groups and the vulnerable requires greater and greater amounts of speech to be stigmatized. That is, justice and protection for the vulnerable comes when more and more nasty things can't be said about them. More and more nasty things will create social consequences for the person being nasty. So while the anti-pluralistic proponent of free speech would never want the government to come in and shut down somebody like Alex Jones, a anti-pluralistic free speech proponent would probably want society to create social norms where anybody who promotes Alex Jones's ideas or Alex Jones himself would face social consequences for promoting those ideas, like a lost job, uh, their content being taken off social media platforms that reach the widest amounts of people, uh, perhaps a lost relationship, stigma, a ruined career if they already started out as a celebrity. For the anti-pluralist, like, this is what speech is supposed to do. By saying that people are saying things that are nasty and horrible and unacceptable, you create massive incentives for them to not say those things. And you can sort of police the politics of your culture independently of persuading people by in some way harming them or strong-arming them without necessarily bringing in the state involved to officially censor them. This is often what libertarians call unofficial censorship, and I don't have a problem with this term, but it is not in violation of freedom of speech to do unofficial censorship. What it is in violation of is pluralistic free speech, which is the free speech that it seems to me that the libertarian right wants now,
and this used to be the freedom of speech that was very much associated with the left. Now what pluralistic free speech does, and in some ways you could say that pluralistic free speech is closer to what a lot of original proponents of free speech, i.e. John Stuart Mill advocated, is that the way that we should change ideology in society using speech is not to stigmatize people who have speech that is harmful, but rather to debate them and persuade them to change their mind. So on pluralistic freedom of speech, you don't stigmatize the person who says, I hate Packies or all black people are stupid. What you do is you argue against that person. You try and persuade them. You try and persuade other people who may agree with them while simultaneously trying not to create an environment in which there's so much hostility and invective thrown at the person with this view that they become incentivized not to express it. Because if people believe that views they have will make them incur hatred thrown on them by other people, they're not going to say those views, and the views will become underground. If they become underground, that means the public can't know what the views are, which is dangerous, and then the only way that they're going to become expressed if they can't become expressed in speech is through violence, which is even more dangerous. So the whole point of pluralistic free speech is to have peaceful political change, where persuasion, rather than strong-arming, is the main motivation for people to say things that aren't harmful. But the price you have to pay for pluralistic free speech is it takes longer for the best ideas to rise to the top. And in the meantime, you have to tolerate the expression of ideas that could be seen as harmful and offensive and even in the short term dangerous to vulnerable groups. You just have to counteract the danger by doing other things to offset the danger that comes from the incitation to uh, hate a certain group. And this is why pluralistic free speech is quite a difficult thing for many people in the West. Um, it's because people have internalized the idea that the kind of speech that we should all collectively avoid is hate speech. So even if we don't want to legally prohibit hate speech, as a matter of sort of civic values, we should discourage and refrain from using hate speech ourselves. And pluralistic free speech seems to give hate speech a kind of free pass. Because if someone is using hate speech, you don't condemn them and tell them, don't say that. What you do is you tell them they're wrong. And this is why pluralistic free speech has such a difficult time today, because people don't want to tolerate the expression of views that they see as harming more vulnerable people, even if that might be the, the price paid for having much better ideology that everyone is on board with, rather than having the enforcement of ideology that people are not on board with that could lead to violence and other quite negative things. This is why pluralistic free speech is so difficult for people. It takes time, and in that meantime, you have to take on certain risks. Um, but the defense of pluralistic free speech is that those risks are worth it because the other risks that come with anti-pluralistic free speech, i.e. violence, are much worse. And this raises an interesting point about hate speech, which often gets missed out on by both its proponents and its critics, and that is hate speech is very poorly defined. So what is the definition of hate speech? The definition of hate speech says, hate speech is speech that attacks a person or group on the basis of attributes such as race, religion, ethnic origin, national origin, sex, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Okay, now what's important to notice about that is that attacks is open to different interpretations, right? If you come from one political side of the spectrum, attacks can mean beat the shit out of them, if you come from another side of the political spectrum, attacks can mean make fun of the way the burqa looks on them. It can mean any number of things. You can stretch the definition to include things that most people would consider completely innocuous, or you could make it so narrow that almost nothing qualifies as actual hate speech apart from calls to beat the shit out of black people or something along those lines. So because hate speech is so vague and interpreted so differently according to which politics is doing the interpreting, hate speech becomes a very convenient and easy way for a political ideology to come on the scene and convince people that this ideology is not ideology, 
but is just in fact etiquette, common sense, the expression of compassion, and so on. And I think that's what progressives have largely done with hate speech in the West, right? Progressives have an interpretation of hate speech, which is different to the conservative one. And they have been able to convince the public, maybe unwittingly, that their interpretation of hate speech isn't ideologically motivated, but is somehow neutral. It's the interpretation that anybody would have, even though it clearly isn't. Because things that progressives consider hate speech are things that nobody in their right mind outside of a progressive would consider hate speech. For instance, for many progressives, saying that gender is not a mental state is hate speech. So making a claim about the metaphysics of biology and gender, according to progressives, is somehow hate speech, rather than something that needs to have a public discussion about it continually happening, because various people feel very strongly about it, and which way the issue goes will be in large part dependent on biological factors that might make certain groups feel deeply upset. So it's part of progressivism that hate speech can include speech which might potentially express true empirical facts or good scientific explanations of those facts, might make certain marginalized groups feel offended or feel scared or feel like their identities are being debated or feel like who they are is being somehow erased or they might feel that they're unsafe because they might feel that in expressing these true empirical facts or these good scientific explanations, they're uh, is a culture being created in which somebody like them will be more likely to be beaten up or dismissed or have their rights trampled on. For these kinds of expressions to be considered hate speech for these sorts of reasons is totally counterintuitive, I think, given what most people believe. But where progressivism has been very successful is that it's used language in a way in which people haven't noticed just how much at odds with common sense all over the political spectrum that progressivism actually is, and that's one of its most disturbing achievements. And with regards to social media platforms that are progressive, there is a similar obfuscation going on when there is a narrative about this kind of extreme right alternative media which wants to completely undermine the public's trust in its factually accurate, earnest CNN, MSNBC, BBC media, or whatever, that is very much a similar kind of sleight of hand. It's a mind game. It's a way for you to ignore the fact that the people that are promoting themselves as mainstream and safe and tolerant and factually accurate and egalitarian and concerned for the vulnerable are actually the intolerant people, the authoritarians, the people that practice bigotry, and the people that are so concerned with hurt feelings and fear among its vulnerable populations that it's willing to stigmatize speech which may even be factually true. So that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with something which is beyond a mere debate about free speech. We're dealing with a way of understanding speech content in a climate where lots of mind games are happening. So the question I suppose that we have to deal with for the remainder of this decade and the beginning of the next is how can we do that in a way where we still honor and respect a decent version of freedom of speech? And I suppose for those of us who are interested in pluralistic freedom of speech as I am, how can we find ways to get beyond the mind game to actually persuade people of the merits of this way of looking at freedom of speech, which in the long run actually has many of the features that progressives claim that they themselves have? And that's why it's so important at the moment to give alternative media a chance. And for those of you in the UK who are interested in giving alternative media a chance live in a town hall setting, come check out The Art of Thinking, which I will be hosting. Our next event is at the LCB Depot at Leicester at 6.30 p.m. August 16th. And the topic of this event, which you can join in and discuss with other people, is the ever-present, abstract, interesting, mind-fucking, and absolutely perplexing and wonderful topic of love. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs>